me. And uh, tonight we're going to do, uh, we are on stewardship month here, but tonight we're, I guess we're stewarding our church tonight. Um, this, is, this is my church, right? That's what it says. That, not mine, Bruce Goddard, but all of us can say our theme for the year, this is what? My church. And um, you should want to take care of my church, your church. And if it's your church, you want to keep it right and keep it straight and keep things uh, on track. And so tonight, uh, next Wednesday night, we have deacon elections. And tonight, we're just going to run through some things about what the Bible says about a deacon and uh, just be uh, look at the scriptures for a few minutes. So in the book of Acts chapter 6, um, let me just preface this. The word deacon is not used in Acts 6. Most people believe it's where this group was first called out and they were later a little bit more specifics needed and they were named and requirements given. Um, understand this, we're to take the path of the New Testament church. Uh, we're in um, the, at the cross and um, the resurrection. 40 days later, there's 3,000 people saved. If, if at a... If at a uh, you know, one time, one day, you go from 120 in the upper room to 3,000, 120. Um, it's chaos. People have questions. People don't understand. People are, you know, what's the Bible mean? And, and what do you mean Isaiah 53 has to do with Jesus? And you, you can imagine these are not illiterate, but they, they don't know anything. And uh, lots and lots of needs. And so the church was growing, ex just multiplying. And so then there's uh, 5,000 saved, and then this many. Then it says the disciples were multiplied. And then it says the churches were multiplied. And this is big. This thing is really going off. And, and so what worked the first few days, Jared, I forgot you tonight. I am so sorry. Josh forgot you tonight. Um, that's not my fault. Great. I don't take the blame for that one. He didn't know I did. I'll take the blame. The buck stops here. The buck always stops at the top unless you're the president and then you point fingers at someone else. But anyway, just had to get my political plug in there. God bless you. Thank God for America where every two terms you're put out no matter what, no matter how dumb the country is. Anyway, we'll take that off before we put it on the internet. No, we won't. Just leave it on there. It's a fact. Um, so we've got this church growing and they, they thought, you know what? Um, we got Ananias and Sapphira lying. And so God fixed it. He just kills them. Well, that's good. So if every time somebody messed up the church, God killed them, we would not be needing a new building program. <laughs> People say, I'm not going to that church. Um, but there, you, you get conflicts and you get uh, people, de deceitful people. And you get, boy, in the first uh, 100 years of the church, there already are corrupt texts of the scriptures going out. And somebody's got to start locking things down. And so... The Lord, uh, Paul, sets up with Timothy. Now, look, you're going to go start churches. You need some leadership. But you can't just put anybody in leadership. Here's what we expect as a pastor. If a man desires the office of a bishop or a pastor, an elder, he desires the good work, and he goes right through the requirements. We've got to keep leadership clean and pure. He goes through that in Ti Timothy and in Titus. In Timothy, he talks about the deacons, what a deacon needs to be. We'll look at that in a couple of minutes. But understand... Sometimes you see more going on through the scriptures because it's developing. It's kind of getting settled down. It's getting organized. And there's some teaching and training going on. And so you get a Judas who's just looking for the money. And he spent three years walking with Jesus. And so don't, don't expect everybody in this room to be completely holy and perfect on the inside. In fact, it would be lucky if anybody is. We're all a mess. So now we're in Acts chapter 6. Look at verse 1. In, the days, in those days... When the number of the disciples was what? Multiply. People getting saved all the time. By the way, people get saved because folks go out and tell people how to get saved. And once in a while, somebody comes saying, how do I get saved? But that's only once in the New Testament that I know of. And it's not going to happen a whole lot in your life and mine. We need to go tell people how to get saved. And so they were a soul winning people. They were out there telling people. Then in the middle of verse 1, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. There was monies and properties being confiscated. It was a big mess. And, and so they were, help, they were selling things and giving it to the apostles or giving it to the church. And they're taking care of people. And, and it, was, it was a mess. And then there's fussing. Well, they got more than us. 
You know, how come they got that and I didn't get this? You say, did people do that in the first century? Were they breathing? You know, that's just life and that's humanity. You know, we didn't get past Cain and Abel before somebody killed somebody. And we didn't, we didn't get out of the garden before somebody's off doing their own thing. We won't say who, but anyway. Uh, verse 2, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples. They're just gobs of believers. And the apostles called the multitude together and said, and here's a key phrase, it is not reason or reasonable or proper that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. All these people getting saved and we've got to help them, we've got to teach them. And by the way, the apostles needed to study. Everybody needs to study and know their Bible and learn their Bible. And, and the, all this is just huge. At, at Acts chapter 6, they've still not seen the gospel go to the Gentiles. They still didn't know that, that a non-Jew could get saved. These are great people. These are soul winning people, but all their doctrines not lined up yet. You know, over in Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter goes out to Cornelius' house and everybody's kind of shook up. <laughs> you went to a Gentile's home and, and well, he got the Holy Spirit as good as you did. Okay, I guess, but I don't know. Now, th this, was a, this was a young place. And so these guys said, we need time to study. And you young men that might preach one day, you better study. You better keep studying all the time studying. And so uh, he said, it's not, it's not appropriate, not reasonable that we should leave the study and the ministry of the word, which is ministering to people, teaching, instructing, soul winning, to go out and serve tables. Uh, look, anybody can make sure that the widows are all getting some bread and water or whatever, you know, some prime rib and filet mignon wrapped in bacon or whatever. So verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men who are businessmen, who are rich, who know how to run businesses. You see that? Uh-uh. You never see God looking for that. Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. The, the, and by the way, uh, this, is, this is, of course, every church. We believe in an independent church. Uh, we believe in the church. The, the word autonomy means each church stands on its own. There's no hierarchy. There's no popes and priests and bishops and people outside ruling. This is our church. We'll vote. We'll make decisions, we'll make right decisions, we'll make wrong decisions. Um, we're, we're an independent body of believers. That's how the New Testament teaches the church to be. And so they, they said, we've got to have honest men. We've got to have men full of the Holy Ghost, men of wisdom. We've got to have some people here. But you know what the business was? It wasn't running a multi-million dollar corporation. It was making sure the widows get fed. It was serving others. It was, let's look after the brethren here. And uh, this has gotten off in an awful lot of churches over the hundreds of years as it's happened. And suddenly you've got businessmen running the church and it becomes a, a big corporate monster. And it's not a ministry to people. It's, it's giant corporations where people honor MBAs more than prayer lives. And, and don't ever let that happen. Doesn't matter how big the church. Nobody's churches in America are bigger than they were in the book of Acts. And none of them had an MBA from Harvard. They were humble, godly, Bible-studying men and women. But these, these men who led these churches, they knew God. And God will take care of it. You know, sometimes people say we need to go to the world to get a good education. I think, where'd Solomon get all his wisdom? Seems to me like he got it from time with God. Lots of time with God. I think, I don't know if that'll work. Well, it worked for Solomon until he, he just forgot that, that class on marriage. <laughs> he, he, missed, he missed marriage 101. And so, verse 4, he says, We will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word, not just a study of the word. He's we're a bunch of monks. 
There are people ministering, going out, and helping people, teaching people the word of God, preaching, soul winning, and study. So verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, Philip, and then he lists the different men. And verse 6, when they had set, the apost uh, set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, most people believe that's where deacons started. Church was growing. It was aggressive. Lots going on. And we just got to take care of all this stuff. You know, who's going to make sure the buses are running? And who's going to make sure that the, the uh, buildings are clean? Who's going to make sure that, that there's organization of classes and all the things in our world? And so, but the purpose of this, understand the purpose. If you go there in verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to the minister to prayer and the ministry of the word. The, if you want to take that as the basic purpose of deacons, it is to free up the pastor or pastoral staff so they could minister the word full time and not be caught up and bogged down with 10,000 details. And uh, some of you guys are going to go start a church one day. You got the whole baby. When we started our church, my wife and I set up the chairs. We cleaned the toilets. First Sunday, I ran my car twice picking up people that I'd met. And, um, you know, I don't know, 50-some people came to church. Only five or six of the seven came in my car. The rest of them drove in. Um, we cleaned up. Uh, I played my guitar for the congregational singing. Came time for the invitation. I played my guitar. Try playing a guitar leading just as I am when no one in the congregation knows just as I am. And then have someone come forward, want to get saved. That takes, a, that takes Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But uh, so anyway, we did it work and we dug through it. But thank God when we started getting help. But uh, from the very beginning, we had to do it all. So some of you young guys that are going to serve God someday in the ministry, don't think that from day one, you've got to have this massive team around you. You know, I had a team, me and my wife. And um, she was in charge of the nursery. She taught Sunday school uh, one hour. She did junior church the next hour. I had two or three saved in my adult service, and I had sixth grade and up, and she had eight or nine saved in the kids. But I just reported we had 53 and nine saved. I didn't say my wife won most of them, but anyway. But it was us. And little by little, God began to give us workers. And, and thank God for all the great workers he's given us. And that is the ministry. But again, the, the main, and this is important, uh, we, we got to understand, you deacons, you that will be deacons one day, you got to understand, your job is to help keep this thing flowing. And to be very honest, out of my hair. And, and that sounds very self-centered. But the last thing you need is a pastor who spent more time with paperwork that week than he did with God. And that is an incredible danger. And that's the world we're in today because we've got permits and, you know, we've got to have insurance that our president approves of. I wonder why we have to have a president that we don't approve of, but that's none of our business. Um, but in any case, since he's the one that's in the office and God let him go there, then... Uh, Somebody's got to put our staff. We've got to care for property insurance and bus insurance and liability insurance. We've got to care for buildings and building repairs and just a, a thousand details. Uh, somebody gave the church. I can't even tell you. Somebody gave the church two wave runners a couple weeks ago. Well, that's a responsibility. Who's going to ride those? <laughs> And so I, I said to a couple of our men, I don't even know where to check the oil on a wave run. I just need to, I just know full throttle. And so a couple, I thought, I'm not even going to look at them. And one, of, one of them said, so where's the key? I said, I don't know. Do they need a key? <laughs> just make them run. And then we'll decide whether we're going to sell them or ride them. But anyway, but, but that, that's, we've got to guard each other. And um, often, if uh, we have, we have so many men and women in our church that are doing jobs um, you know, someone, and I, please, I'm not, I, I love you. I'll do anything you want. But when someone calls me, you want to know somebody else's phone number? There are lots of people who know phone numbers beside the pastor. Now, if you've got a burden, bring it to me. If you need a phone number, call directory assistance. <laughs> I'm not chewing anybody. I can't think of anybody who's ever done that. But it happens. <laughs> That's called a selective memory. Pastor, I, 
I need my tire changed, triple A. Come by, pick up my card. You can use my card, but I'm not changing your tire. But we have a Brother Beal, I don't know anybody any busier than Brother Beal trying to keep this school together and on half the budget he should be running it on. And, and uh, guard, guard, guard those who are ministering to your family. Protect them as much as you can. That's the whole point of the deacons. Deacons are not bosses. They're not telling everybody how to run things. Our deacons in our church don't have the power to, to make decisions. They're an advisory capacity. They're, they're, I need a group of people, and I, I don't know what. What do you want to do with this? How do you want to handle it? And if it's anything to do with, with decisions or anything that, that the whole church should be involved in, then we bring it to a church meeting or we bring it to a men's meeting because I believe there's safety in the whole. Uh, I think the group of men, we have these men's meetings, and I'll just tell you this, you're new or you don't know this, but in 32 years of having men's meetings, I have never known of our group of men to make a decision that was wrong. Not once. When I met with our men, and if we're split, we walk out of the room and drop it. But if we, if we get unified, never, twice, I've completely disagreed with the vote of our men, and both times I was wrong. I, I love the, the, the brethren. I love the unity of this thing. Um, and the only reason we need deacons is things get big enough where I can't keep the same guys. We don't know what's going on. So let's, let's look on a little bit further. Here at Faith Baptist Church, the deacons do act as our school board. Uh, they serve communion. There's a few things that I just gave them as their jobs. We've got to have a school board technically, those that are going to take care of who gets booted out, who makes rules, because Brother Beal and I got tired of being blamed for kicking people's kids out. So now we don't kick anybody's kids out. It's those bad deacons. Uh, gets us out of trouble. Talk to that Tim Heck guy. He's in charge of those bad deacons. Um, anyway, so uh, here we look at this very simple thing. Look over now to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, understand, some of you that are from other churches, um, and, um, God gives the church great liberty. You find 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'm sorry, uh, maybe chapter, yeah, chapter 3, I messed up, chapter 3. Um, God gives the church liberty. Some people say, how come that church does it this way and this church does it this way? Because God is so awesome. You know, you read through, I've got a little booklet called uh, Fully Persuaded, if you want to pick it up from the office sometime. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, God gives this lengthy, lengthy lesson on long hair on men. It's a shame for a, for a man to have long hair. The word shame is the same word used to describe a homosexual. That's what God thinks of long hair in a man. And long hair is supposed to be on a woman. A, man, a woman's hair is to cover her. A man's hair shouldn't cover him. And on and on, big old length of thing. And then at the end of it, he says, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom in the churches of God. Don't fight with people. God grief. If the guy wants a ponytail, let him have a ponytail. Just go by and pull it now and then. Um, it's not a problem. Eating meat. Paul said all things are clean if they be received with thanksgiving. Some of you are struggling with this a little bit. Just because God says he wants it this way doesn't mean he won't let you do it this way. God's incredible. Does God have a preference? Of course. But we're a mess. You understand that, right? And God is just so happy to have anybody saved. And then that they'll read their Bible, whoopee! God is so thrilled that you got saved. He's so happy. Wrote your name in the book of life. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner. One of those idiots got it. This is awesome. Woohoo! Yeah, that naughty has got a ponytail. That should be on his wife, but ah, who cares? We'll, we'll cut it when he gets to heaven. Um, he makes it very clear what he believes. But over uh, in, in the book of Romans, talking about food, uh, he said all things are clean if they be received with thanksgiving. Thank God I had shrimp for dinner last night. I like shrimp. Man, you're an Old Testament Jew. You couldn't eat shrimp. I don't want that. I had bacon for breakfast this morning. I can't imagine a world without bacon. That's just wonderful. Um, I like bacon. Uh, and uh, so, but he said, uh, all things are clean, eat whatever you want. You receive with thanksgiving, it's yours, eat it. But he said, but these people don't understand that and they get offended. And he said, if eating meat offends my brother, I won't eat meat. 
And that's when he said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That means you that believe it's all right to eat meat, be fully convinced it's right. And you that believe you can't eat all the meat, stand for it. So which one's right? Yes. <laughs> does God have a, an opinion? He does. Will God let you be wrong? Yes. Well, he just wants you to grow in grace. And I know some of you, are, if you're wrestling with that, call the office, ask for a copy of the little, just little pamphlet, fully persuaded, and uh, it, it'll help you it's in great detail. And it's not long. You can read it in a few minutes. But, but understand this. There's, God gives the church great liberty. So uh, within the, the, how about this? God says, let a woman adorn herself in what kind of apparel? So what's modest? You figure it out. God uses all kinds of abstracts because he didn't want to deal with this type of material. And that's clingy and that's see-through and that's, he just said, just be modest, just dumb women. You're too pretty to show everything off. And um, so God uses a lot of simple principles. And if you were today in a Baptist church in Baghdad, most of you would not be modest. You'd have to put a lot more on. Say, well, who's right? both and i'm not saying obviously there are things that are immodest and i'm not trying to, to you know i don't know anybody that's got standards that they fuss on any more than i do but i want you to understand god gives our churches liberty and we as a church get to make some decisions and there are very good people who are not like us and they're wonderful people but we're not changing i learned from the best I'm not changing Understand this, you don't change from lane A to lane B. Change is a decision and it's a direction. And change means now I am available to be changing. Change is like a flashlight. It keeps going and going. So you either stay straight or you become a changeable person. That's one of the reasons the whole lesson on change. We don't change around here. We're gonna, we will die, I will die, believing and preaching the same thing I preached 32 years ago when I started. Why? Because it's safe. Is everything perfect? No, look in the mirror. We're not perfect, but it's safe. It's been blessed. We've seen God's incredible blessings. We will not waver. We're not going to change. But I mean, there's good people in other places. So with all that in mind, we take, we take these principles um, for a pastor and a deacon and the church principles. And we, this is Faith Baptist Church. And you know what? This is my church. You go to our house, Christmas is different at our house than at your house, maybe. I don't know. But it's our house. It's how we do things. And it's okay that you don't do things just like I do things. Um, everybody's family is different. I know people that for family devotions, they all sit down in a circle and daddy teaches the Bible to them. And then they hold hands and they all pray. We don't hold hands when we pray. I know some people think we're not even saved. <laughs> I'd never, look, I didn't get saved till I was in college. I was in a bunch of roughneck people's lives. And I get saved, go to Bible college, race through Howells Anderson, come here, start the church. We've been here a few weeks, meet with some men in the building. We were talking about renting, and there's five or six of us men. I said, Look, all you men meet me, we'll walk around, we'll pray. We meet in the parking lot. I said, Well, we ought to pray about this thing. And I bow my head, and people are grabbing my hands men, full grown men holding my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if it was, you know, I was at my father-in-law's house and it's my girlfriend, let's hold hands while we pray. <laughs> I have two daughters. We don't hold hands in my house when we pray. But um, everybody's different what they do. God gives you wonderful liberty in your home and in your church and your, in all those things. So we're going to run through a few quick things here in 1 Timothy. If you look with me at chapter 3. The first seven verses are talking about the pastor. And since we're not voting on the pastor tonight, I hope, because <laughs> you got to announce it three weeks ahead of time. Amen. <laughs> no, three services ahead of time. Um, uh, so anyway, but we're just talking about deacons. So uh, look at verse 8. Likewise. Now, likewise, a lot of what he said about pastors has to do with the deacon, um, at least 
Verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall in the reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, so he's bringing some of those deacon, uh, pastor requirements into the deacon's life. Likewise, must the deacon be grave. And I'm just going to run through some words here. Grave is a, is a word, not way up and way down. Grave, a steady, um, doesn't have to be morbid, but, but um, somebody who's serious about life. And uh, a deacon must be grave, not double-tongued, not somebody who says one thing and lives another, or double-tongued. He says, uh, you know, a politician is double-tongued. He's meeting with these people, he says that. He's meeting with these people, he says the opposite. That's double-tongued. A deacon ought to be living and preaching and practicing and talking the same thing all the time. And so a deacon should not be double-tongued um, and not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Uh, we modified the mo much wine in our church, meaning you can take NyQuil or Banaka. That's all much wine is. Uh, you've got to make a commitment. You don't drink booze, period, in our church as a deacon. And uh, that's just been our policy. It's where I was trained from both pastors I had. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Um, you, you shouldn't be covetous of money, greedy of money. You get a guy who's worried about money and really hungry, but he's going to make dumb decisions. Uh, we've got to keep our focus right on this thing of money. And I would encourage you that are Bible studies, just take the word covet and covetous and covetousness and just study it. I just recently went through all that in the, in the Bible in my own study. That's a wicked sin. God probably um, says more negative about the word covet or some form of the word covetous than maybe any other sin in the Bible. It's maybe idolatry. And then he said covetousness is idolatry. And so, uh, boy, you can't be, uh, you're, you're asking, when we have a deacon election, you're singling out some men to help me get a touch on this whole ministry. You don't want a guy who's greedy of money influencing your pastor's thinking. Uh, I often think if I was the president, the key would be getting the right cabinet because I couldn't know it all. Um, but you get the wrong advisors, you're going to be an idiot. Verse 9, what else should the deacons be? Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. First of all, holding. It should be their own. They shouldn't be in the faith and out of the faith. If they're, they're faithful and hanging on to the truth this month, but last month, they, oh, I, don't know if I'm, I'm just, I don't know about church and God. No way. They got to be hanging on to the faith and in a pure conscience. In their own heart, it should be a sincere thing, not an outward thing. There should be no guilt inside. And again, you don't know what's in a man's heart. But the, uh, I heard somebody say their pastor was trying to figure out for sure what he believed about some things. I thought he needs to resign the ministry. That's right. yes. Figure out what he believes and then go back into the ministry. Uh, if something happens to me and you bring a pastor and you ask him anything he wants, if he doesn't know what he believes, then tell, you're not the one, man. We need a guy who knows what he believes, where he's going, and how he's going to get there. Um, uh, somebody has got to be locked in. Verse 10, and let these also first be proved. So there needs to be some time. You should know the men. And sometimes the church grows. There are men that could be deacons, but because of their personality or their uh, maybe their, their use this personality, they're not well known. And um, they can kind of be on the sidelines and, uh, boy, they're first class men in every way, but they don't get, their name doesn't get brought up or they don't get elected as a deacon simply because nobody knows them. And we do run a, a you know, vote on a majority here. And so, but being proved means people need to know you. Um, again, if you're going to pick a deacon, you should, uh, Bob Coates, love him, he's in heaven, I can talk about him. He used to come up with a deacon ballot and say, because he'll have all the names to circle the ones you want. And he just runs one big circle and says, I just love everybody, preacher. I say, yeah, I love everybody too, but I don't want them all doing brain surgery on me. <laughs> you're, you're putting some people in position of influence here. You ought to pick them out carefully. Um, let them be proved. Um, have some time. And, and certainly, uh, just because a guy stands in a pulpit and says, here's what I believe, um, you better find out what he practices. And again, we're, I'm talking about pastors a little bit here just because of things we've seen in recent years. Uh, I'm gone. Somebody comes in and says, oh, yeah, I believe this just like you and that just like you and that just like you. Go where he came from and see if he lived just like you. See if he preaches. I know people who, who believe in their heart what we believe, but they never say it from the pulpit for fear they'd lose a church member. 
Uh, that's called a pussyfooter. That's called a compromiser. That's called a spiritual wimp. Um, if, he, if it's right, it ought to be out there. Uh, so let it, these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found. What's that word? Blameless. Their faith, their walk with God, their reputation ought to be unblemished. We are in a, in a culture in America where you, can, you just about can't be disqualified unless you're a member of the Tea Party. You can be any kind of an idiot and hold public office. You could be somebody who's never done anything and be elected to, to high political office. And um, in, the, in the spiritual world, and I could name names over the last 20, 25 years, some pastors running off with a prostitute and uh, the church says, well, he's a good man and we're all sinners and we're under the age of grace. Let's bring him back. Yeah, let's bring him back. Make him a church member. If he wants a job, let him vacuum the floors and clean the bathrooms. There's nothing wrong with cleaning the floors and the bathrooms, but you ought not be the preacher. You ought to be in, in a position of leadership. Um, he says, well, let them know who they are and let them be found blameless. We want these guys having a reputation that is un, un, unblemished. But not only that, he's talking about deacons. He goes a little bit further. Can you believe this next in politic, un politically incorrect statement. Look at verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave. You know why the wife's involved? Because mama really influences the house. And he says, you cannot have a man you're putting into a position of trust that his wife doesn't fit the bill. Number one, grave. Some, again, back to the word we said at the beginning, even-tempered, not some flighty uh, up and down and all over and, and, uh, and thank God for emotion and feelings and all that. But as uh, somebody said when Hillary Clinton was running for office, we don't need a woman in her 50s to early 60s having any amount of worldwide power and an army behind her. <laughs> and we won't go into any more biological discussion than that. But... There's just some instability along the way sometimes. And besides, anyway, there's a lot of reasons we didn't want Hillary. But um, even so must their wives be grave, a spirit of reserve, a spirit of holiness, someone who is reserved in their, in their demeanor, that grave, reserved demeanor, character that's honorable. Then the next thing about a deacon's wife, she can't be a slanderer. Uh, some of you, I'm, I'm a little blunt doing this. You, you ought to see... Uh, <coughs> Jim Rushing's in heaven, but Brother Rushing, when it came time for deacon elections, the week before the election, he'd bring all the deacons up here that are prospective deacons, and he'd have them sit on the platform, no pulpit here, and he had a list of about 20 questions he'd ask, and he'd look at this one, there's, you know, there's uh, whoever the deacon is, and he'd say, let me ask you something. If your wife doesn't like something the preacher's doing, he's the preacher, so your wife doesn't like something I'm doing, you're going to keep her in subjection? Says so another one, all right, Bill? You want to be deacon? You tell us in front of the whole church. Are your kids doing what you tell them to do or are they fussing with you? He had, I think, 20 questions. And I said, whoa, no wonder you had five churches. You had to keep leaving. <laughs> but look, that's what God said. God says, look, you're going to pick a deacon. His wife better be grave, that even temperate spirit of of, uh, of honor and, and, uh, and evenness. And then, uh, then not a slanderer. Can't have, I don't care how good the guy is. If his wife's slandering people, he's going to come home. She's going to be slandering people, and she will influence him. She's got to be sober, sobriety, under control, not an emotional mess. Verse 12, uh, let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Now, there's one that is a little bit of a vague. And many, many years ago, some people say that means only one at a time. That's what it meant in the New Testament. All right. And by the way, there was a lot of, of uh, people with multiple spouses in the New Testament era. You know, Abraham had a bunch. He was a friend of God. David was God's, the man after God's own heart. He had a bunch of wives. None of them had a lick of sense. And um, Solomon had 900, you know, 300 wives and 600 substitutes and whole big mess there. So I went to our men 30 years ago, maybe a little less than that, 28 years ago when we decided to have deacons. And I said, now, there's only two ways to look at this, either one at a time or never been divorced and you got to decide and it wasn't it, we didn't have deacons at the time we had a room full of men 
And I know right where we were, we were in the teen, was the teen trailer, was our school room at the time, we had a deacon's meeting, and they all voted, they voted unanimously that that meant not divorce. So we locked it down in our church documents that we take that as meaning not divorce. So and we have some of the finest men in our church that have been divorced. They can serve in any kind of capacity except the deacon or the pastor because our men made a decision many, many years ago. Typically when men's names get to me uh, that are to be a deacon, um, sometimes they just I don't want to just let me serve God on my own. I don't need a position. And that happens often. And then other times either they've been divorced or they don't tithe. And uh, great, no problem, won't have you deacon, love you, God bless you, you're still on the team, doesn't, doesn't hurt anybody standing here, no one knows. I'm the only one that talks to people, or I give them a list of things and they just don't turn, a turn their name in, and it's none of my business, why? But the deacon, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, then look at this, ruling their children and their own houses well. And that's very broad. And you can interpret that however you want, but an out-of-control home, a home where the wife is fussing at the husband and, and wanting her way and, and uh, kids that are arguing. Look, one of the reasons you shouldn't let your children watch TV uh, is kids on TV are always fussing at the parents. Right. Yes. You know, mom tells the kid something, the kid goes, oh, and walks. You know, you only do that once in our house. Amen. And as soon as you come back to consciousness, you realize that was a wrong move. Nobody stomps their feet, nobody slams the door, nobody grunts and groans. We don't live that way. Um, once you get out of the house, you can live any old way you want. I can't control that when you're eating my food, sleeping in our beds and uh, getting into our refrigerator. So um, the, the guy, you're, next Wednesday, you're going to mark some names, ask yourself, that, that guy rule his house well. That's what you're looking for. How does he rule? Is he a good administrator? Verse 13, they that have used the office of a deacon, well, purchase to themselves a good degree. And what that word degree means, it, it, and again, this is very politically incorrect, but it, it, the, it's the word a step. It's, you know how you, in politics, especially in California right now, because we're losing a lot of big leaders in California, people, who's moving up the ladder? That's exactly what that's talking about. Uh, they purchased themselves a good degree. It means they've got a position, a position of trust, a position of esteem, a position that might lead to something else. And you're a church member. Uh, you end up being a deacon. You might end up being the next one they send to the mission field or the next one to pass to the next church they're starting. And so that's you purchase by your faithful testimony, your loyalty, your hard work, your good life. You purchase some things and you can move up the ladder. And that's just really what it's talking about there, whether it all seems very Christian in our world or not. Um, it's, uh, and, and then he says at the end of verse 13, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And uh, let me just say this in closing. Every time you take a step of faith in doing the right thing, God gives you something for it. Let me say this. So you, let's just, example, you've, you've never gone soul. You've never learned to witness to anybody. You start going out with one of us. Just start going with us. Just say, I'll go, but I'm not going to talk. I just want to listen. You start going and God will give you something. God begins to build you. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purgeth. And so you get out with a soul winner and, um, and none of us are great soul winners. Don't feel like, oh, I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> Look, we're just people. It's the God we're talking about that's great. And so um, you say, you know what? I, I'd like to work on a bus route. You step out and start working on a bus route. God will start filling you with good stuff. Sometimes we have Christians who are over here thinking, I just don't have very much to offer. Then go do something. Do you know who has a lot to offer? Those who are doing. Because the doing comes first and the filling comes later. You get busy teaching a class, working on a bus route, God will fill you and fill you. You purchase yourself great boldness in the faith. You might say, how did that person get so confident to go out and do all that? They've been doing it. How come that person seems so together? It just seems like they don't have any confidence to do anything because they've never done anything. You don't get experience doing nothing. You get experience doing. Jesus said, um, that if you, if any man do my will, 
the same shall know of the doctrine. You want to know good Bible doctrine? Start obeying. And you'll think, doesn't matter, start with tithing. Start with Bible reading. Start with going to church more faithfully. Start with um, going soul winning. Start with ministry. And, and I'll tell you what else happens. There are people on this side who are full with much wisdom and, and uh, confidence and, ass and assurance. Some of you teenagers, let me just tell you your future. There's some young people because you were trained right, good homes, good school, good families. And during your teen years, you learned to serve and you really had a lot of promise. And then you did less and you did less, and you did less, and you did less, and every step you took this way cost you something. And God began pulling the insides out of you. And it doesn't mean you're bad. And then you get over here and you say, I just don't feel very confident. How could you have gone to a Christian school, had those wonderful Christian parents, and, and, and uh, haven't witnessed to somebody in a year, and, and don't ever hardly read your Bible, and so, so uh, very superficial in your Christianity. You might say, how could that happen to somebody? They stopped doing. They stopped doing, they stopped being, they stopped investing. And the more we do, the more we give. And so these deacons, when a man uses the office of a deacon, his marriage, his kids, his servant's heart, um, God starts putting stuff in there. Let me just quickly run through some things. Um, in our church, here's a list of simple, simple list of requirements. Um, it's not exhaustive, but we want our deacons to be saved. What a concept. And baptized by immersion, uh, members of our church, a good marriage, good children, again, talking about those living under their own roof, not divorced, loyal to the ministries, loyal to the leadership at the church and the faith, faithful to tithe, faithful to be involved in some sewing ministry every week. And if it's been three or four or five weeks since you've been to your jail or your rest home or on your bus route or visiting your Sunday school class or knocking on doors, either get right or just pull your name off the deacon ballot, okay? Uh, that's as simple as that. A walk with God. Um, um, uh, and then there's a whole string of other things in our church constitution that you could read. But um, again, this is in a kind of a little bit of a... Of a um, I don't know, academic lesson tonight. There's much more we could look at in the Bible. I love that little phrase, full of uh, the Holy Ghost. Is there any evidence of the Holy Spirit in a man? This is, you know, I'm not picking on anybody, but I'll just close with this because we've got so many young men in here and a lot of young men going to college, going to Bible college. One of the saddest things as your pastor that I've seen in America is it's been at least five years since I've been at a conference, a pastor's conference, where I've heard anybody mention the Holy Spirit. Maybe longer. The kind of Christianity I grew up in, you were, you were, we heard preaching on the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the power of God and the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the moving of the Holy Spirit. If I felt like I could stand in this pulpit on a Sunday and not have the Holy Spirit in intimately moving in someone's heart in, the, in a crowd as big as ours, I'd quit the ministry. I go get, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you how many dozens and dozens, hundreds of times someone's come and said, how did you know? I got this crystal ball. No, I don't know. But I've got a friend. And, and I want his blessing on my lessons. And I want, I want to be able to go out and see a total stranger I've never met in my life and knock on the door. And they're too busy to talk. And once we've talked for a few minutes, they open the door a little wider and talk a few more minutes. And 15 minutes later, they're, they're tears in their face, total stranger, and bowing their head. And, oh, God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Hallelujah. There's a spirit of God who still lives. But we don't have that in our pulpits. And, um, and these guys say, we don't want deacons that are not full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith. We've got to guard a spiritual church. Because what we've got in America, we've gotten the churches that are so orderly. Everything is just perfect. And people walk in the door and, the, you know, the praise team's doing their thing and the coffee pot's doing its thing and, and the fellowship's going real smooth and you, and you got the prettiest and best looking couples out there as greeters. You ever see we have for greeters? I'm not looking at anybody. You look at where we started our church. In a tent. Pasquale's Clubhouse, first time the Beals and, 
Lutzes and others, Woolies, and many of you came to our church. We had we had to put we had a blanket over the jukebox. We had to put a blanket over a picture on the wall because it was a naked woman up there. We had midget wrestlers in speedos doing poses, <laughs> beer signs hanging all over, and the tent, green carpet, orange and white tent, porta potties, and you better have God. You better have a big old dose of God blinding their eyes. I'll never forget when Brother Ms. Beale came the first time. We knew them already. But when they came out to the church the first time, I'm watching them. Brett's two. The twins are in car seats and our nursery's on a hippie bus. We got it from the Partridge family. Some of you don't know who that is, but old people do. And I'm watching them. I thought, I remember coming out of our house and I see them walking toward the bus thinking they'll never come back. They'll never, they'll never come back. They'll never come back. <laughs> God blinded them, <laughs> took out half the brain or something, I don't know what. But, oh, we need the Holy Spirit, and we need his wisdom and his faith to do the work of God. All right, let's pray. Father, bless us tonight. Thank you for your book and for your blessing. How we owe you. There's nothing, nothing in the world that we need like we need you. And we'd love the, some more buildings. We'd love some more money, and we'd love some more... We look at a whole bunch of mores we'd like, God, but the one thing we just have to have is you. We need you in leadership here. We need you giving us leaders who walk with you. We need you in every home and every marriage. May every lady and man in this room just decide, I want to be what I'm supposed to be with the touch of heaven on my life. May these teenagers get a vision of their life making a difference in a huge way. Father, call some young men and some young young ladies to go do something big with their life. And, and we're just so grateful that it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Bless us as we go and give us just what we need to get through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, two things real quick.